So I wanted to uh, talk today about uh, how do we understand living systems? You know, what, how are we going to achieve understanding of the complexity of life when you look at uh, the diversity of life before us and, and the strings of DNA, right, that depend on, that define whether you're going to become a frog or a human, right, just by variations in the letters. How do we understand that? How do we come to understand that vast complexity and what defines uh, how we behave, how we interact with others, how, how flowers bloom, and so on? So I wanted to give an analogy of a, of a movie. Think about uh, this ad when you're watching it, all the processes going on in your brain at once to recognize scenes, to recognize objects, to put those objects together to form a picture, and then the fluid motion that you're seamlessly integrating all the different correlations that are going on in this scene to achieve some understanding of the type of uh, uh, video that you're, you're watching right now. Your mind is performing an amazing complexity of operations to achieve that kind of understanding. So have that in mind now when we, when we talk a little bit about how we understand biology, uh, the biology of disease. So I wanted to bring up uh, Huntington's disease as one of the first real successes in human genetics uh, that was solved in a very reductionist way. Huntington's disease, of course, a really horrific disease, uh, neurodegenerative disease, uh, uh, really awful. But it was solved by looking at mutations in DNA uh, that perfectly segregated in families that, that had this disorder. And, and from that correlation of every time you see a red dot in one of these families, so that's just a pedigree representing a family, the red uh, individuals are individuals with Huntington's. And every time you were affected with this disease, you had a mutation in this gene, a certain variation in the DNA that defined uh, your, your risk and onset of that disease. So that was a, a, a stunning success for genetics, a reductionist sort of uh, way of thinking. And that led to a revolution, right, where we then exploded into assaying all parts of your DNA, this linear string of letters, to look at how do variations in those letters predispose you to different uh, behaviors, diseases, and so on. We had companies like 23andMe popping up that were promising to look at your DNA and tell you how to, how to live a better life and what your risks of different uh, uh, diseases or, or wellness were. And, but when we think about, did that really lead to an understanding of disease, I'll pull all the way back to 30 plus years ago when that Huntington's disease gene was found. 30 years have passed, given the knowledge of that gene, and where's the cure for Huntington's? Where's the effective treatment for Huntington's? Right, there is not a, a cure, there is not uh, even an effective treatment. And of course, this isn't specific to Huntington's disease. We see this with Alzheimer's disease, APOE, the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's. Uh, for those unfortunate enough to carry the mutation in that gene that gives you a very increased risk of developing that disease. 19 years ago, that was, that was identified, and yet we still don't have an understanding of uh, how that uh, predisposes you to Alzheimer's. We don't have treatments that are really based on that discovery and so on. So why is it that we can accumulate this knowledge, but we're not achieving understanding to, to actually impact human well-being? And now I'll take you back to the movie analogy. We're looking at the DNA in a very one-dimensional way, and so I'm, I'm going to show you this movie now. The graphic you're seeing there is the movie that I was showing you, but what I did is I took each frame, each frame of that movie, aligned all the pixels over all the frames in the movie, and then I took the average of each of those pixels across the frames, and uh, that's what you're looking at here. And that's what we're doing in, in genetics. By looking at it one dimension at a time, we're trying to understand the movie of life by looking at the averages. And you can't look at that average of frames uh, fixed on the screen before you and understand anything about the video clip that I was showing, right? So we're not gonna understand human diseases or complex human or complex living system behavior by looking at a single dimension at a time. In fact, what we know is that different dimensions that make up every living cell in your body all the DNA components, the RNA, the protein, the metabolites, they're interconnected in highly nonlinear ways to form these networks, right, that define the biological process that defines your life. And these networks are not acting in isolation, right, they act in a concert of network of networks. And it's that interplay of networks of networks that defines the complexity of living systems. And once we understand this, we can take these, these networks, these units that define the complexity, and we can start understanding how perturbations, how changes in the environment or your DNA, how do they affect 
a particular network and how does that propagate through to other networks in, in the system. So here we're looking at a given cell or a tissue type, the communication that's going on between networks, but we're more complicated than a, than a single cell, right, or, or organ. We're made up of lots of different organ systems. And so what we really want to be understanding are, is how does perturbations in one part of the system and one tissue propagate through to the system and equilibrate and affect other tissues to, to define the complexity of life. So this is the model. This is how we want to understand this complex living system, just like you understand a movie, but we're going to have to do a lot more work to get to this sort of uh, view, this sort of movie, to uh, actually say something, and that's sort of uh, what my work is all about. So we need to embrace complexity. Right? We need to not shy away, not look in single dimensions, but we need to embrace the whole, understand how they're all integrated. And much like uh, most of you know the story of the blind man and the elephant, if you're sampling a single dimension at a time, a single part of that elephant at a time, you can walk away with a very different understanding of what that object is than if you're sampling uh, the, the animal in whole. Uh, the problem, though, is that embracing complexity is very difficult. Right? And why is it difficult? Well, we can go back 400 years to Francis Bacon, who gave us the answer. He was talking about the fallacies to which we uh, succumb in our uncritical thinking. And chief among these fallacies were assuming that more order, assuming more order than actually exists in chaotic nature. And we don't have to look very far in the textbooks to see uh, this simplification at hand. Here, and, and here's how we typically think, think of biological processes, biochemical processes, we tend to think of as simple linearly ordered pathways. So you open a textbook and you want to see what involves TGF beta signaling, and what you're going to read is this receptor, TGF BR2, binds this ligand. Uh, in the presence of that li ligand, this gets phosphorylated, forms this complex, and then goes on to, to do some magic. So that's the simple linearly ordered pathways that, that uh, we want to believe are true. And what this tells me is that our brains are wired for storytelling, right? not statistical uncertainty. And so what we end up doing is, is telling ourselves simple stories to explain very complex things that we don't really understand. So we need to break out of this kind of simplified thinking. And of course, this isn't specific to biology, by the way. We see this throughout human history, whether it's Zeus, the sky god throwing down the bolts of lightning, or the Earth being the center of the universe, or the Earth being flat or again, biology being represented by simple linearly ordered systems. These are the sim simple things we like to tell ourselves to explain the complex thing. So how do we break out of this uh, want to tell stories? What we can do is both technological innovation in, in integrate, generating big data, sampling the universe as broadly as we can, and then integrating that information into the form of these models of the type of network I showed you to uh, achieve understanding. One of the technology I was involved in inventing that helps us go down this road is a single molecule uh, sequencing system. What you're looking at there is a single molecule of DNA polymerase that's in every single one of the cells of your body that you know, synthesizes your DNA. And we developed a technology where we can isolate that single molecule in a little nano well, 100 nanometers in diameter, 100 nanometers high. We can actually isolate it there and watch the DNA polymerase as it's carrying out its function, as it's synthesizing, synthesizing the DNA. And we, we, we don't need to isolate ourselves to just a single molecule that we're looking at in isolation, but we can multiplex this and look at hundreds of thousands of these molecular reactions car carried out uh, at the same time. So again, this is our ability now to focus down on the very, very nano scale on single molecules of activity and see how they build up uh, to form the complex whole. This type of technology revolutionizes how we can do uh, pretty amazing things like real-time disease surveillance. So we can employ this technology to actually, to actually sequence and uh, you know, say uh, pathogens that are wreaking havoc around the world. We can actually sequence those in real time and, and elucidate the complexity that's driving those pathogenic outbreaks. And that's something we did in the cholera outbreak in Haiti. You may remember that from 2010 in which a pretty, you know, earthquake happened, pretty horrific. Following that was this horrific outbreak of cholera. And the question was, where did that cholera come, come from? Was it brought there from afar by UN forces, or did it emerge naturally from the waters of Haiti? There was lots of political debate going on about that, but not science. What we were able to do was resolve that by, in real time, sequencing the pathogen that was you know, in the outbreak, comparing it to other uh, pathogens around the globe, 
and ultimately uh, came up with the answer. And just to give you an idea of how fast this can now occur with this kind of technology, we got the DNA from Haiti from clinical isolates uh, from people who were infected in Haiti on, on one day. We sequenced those on the same day, right, in addition to other uh, forms of cholera seen around the globe. Uh, we did some analysis in a couple of days, uh, wrote up a paper, and it was published online in the New England Journal of Medicine three weeks after we received samples from Haiti. Uh, so it was sort of a, uh, like being on a rocket ship, it was a very intense experience, one of the first ever of doing a real-time analysis during a pathogenic outbreak and leveraging the technology to do that. And, and then again, we uh, showed that this uh, particular strain of cholera had emerged from a strain seen in Bangladesh, so it didn't arise naturally from the waters of Haiti, but in fact was carried from afar. And uh, so that's sort of the molecular technology that's now coming about that's pretty amazing single molecule, real time, we're able to put all these stories together, uh, but we also see a revolution happening in the physiological censoring uh, arena as well. So if you look at uh, things like the, uh, the Oracle, Team Oracle's uh, America's Cup boat, uh, that boat is outfitted with 300 different sensors monitoring all a a aspects of that, of that boat. From the, from the sails, to the, to the ropes, to the strain on the hull, to the crew, uh, 3,000 different variables are being measured at 10 times every second, and that data is being crunched in real time, and real time decisions are being made about the performance of that boat based on the data collected. We see the same sort of thing going on in the Indy races. Uh, Team Honda uh, has, a, has their car that's outfitted with 200 different sensors, again, collecting information on all aspects of that car, around a gigabyte of data each lap being generated, and then the performance of that car and the driver being tuned in real time as, uh, as the race is uh, going on. So this same sort of technology that we're seeing applied to uh, cool machines, we can, we can apply now to uh, our own machines to better understand not only what's going on at the molecular level, but what's going on at the physiological level. And so, of course, a number of companies now coming out with you know, the wearable devices, sensors that are helping uh, collect that kind of data, everything from uh, the uh, bio uh, Bluetooth enabled uh, tattoo sensors that can measure different physiological parameters of your being uh, to the uh, Pixie Scientific having the little sensors in the diapers to say what your baby is excreting out of its system. Uh, so all the fun things you wanted to know about your uh, baby. Uh, we have companies like Theranos, right, that are now able to take very, very small quantities of blood and carry out a whole range of tests on you. You can walk into your Walgreens, uh, the Walgreens where Theranos is represented, and for a pretty small amount of money, give a very small amount of blood and learn a whole bunch about yourself from these kinds of tests. So a real revolution going on about how we can assay different parts of our system. Uh, this is complemented by all the streams of data that are now coming from, from governments or from cities, uh, so the Urban uh, Science and Pro Progress Center in New York collects all the information that's streaming from New York City, uh, traffic patterns, pollution patterns, electricity usage, and so on. All of this information right, can be piled on top of all the physiological sensing and molecular data to provide a more holistic picture of your uh, self. Of course, to play this game, to be able to take all of that data and do something useful with it, you need uh, pretty high-end computational infrastructure, so we spend a lot of time on uh, supercomputers and with guys uh, that I work with, like Jeff Hammerbacher, who was the founding chief data scientist at Facebook, and then uh, pioneered uh, Cloudera, which is a, an amazing revolution in how we can br bring Hadoop-style computing to the masses to solve these big data problems. But you need to know what to do on that computational hardware. You, know how to take, you, you need to know how to take these streams of data, and what do we want to do with all that information? What we want to do is connect up the molecular, what's happening on you at the molecular level. We want to hook that molecular state information up with the physiological information in the context of all the different environmental forces that are at play on your system. So that's the goal. And the way we do, the way we form these models is we start with all these variables, we take things like DNA and RNA that are reflecting the state of these variables, we apply some mathematics, and then we simply start linking, understanding the relationship amongst all these variables simultaneously over all the variables in the space. And what we get lock onto is a network model, a predictive causal model of the system that we can then query to understand uh, what's going on in the system. And just as a quick example of how we've applied this to a number of human diseases, but I'll show you one, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, on how we could take all the information that's 
uh, generated in the linear domain. So remember the DNA, all the big genetic studies that are identifying all the different genes that have you know, variations that cause disease, but we can't understand how they all fit together, right? how they actually cause disease and then come up with therapeutics uh, that are actually based on that understanding to treat that particular disease. So I'll show you an example of how we took 150, 163 genes that were uh, mutated in the human population that predispose you to get inflammatory bowel disease. So the question was, how do we take those 163 genes and understand how do they fit together? What, how do they affect the system in ways that give you inflammatory bowel disease? So again, what we do is we want to go from this linear domain of DNA to this highly nonlinear and complex domain uh, showed here, which are these network models that we can project the information onto to resolve what those uh, DNA loci are doing. So what you're looking at here is sort of a universe of, of uh, molecular activity. The yellow and pink nodes represent genes. They represent DNA variants that cause disease. They represent clinical parameters. They represent metabolic, proteomic parameters. And what we've done is we've, in the population, we've understood how these all fit together, how they communicate with one another in this vast array of data. And the, the yellow and red uh, edges in this network are the part of the network that's most impacted by those, those uh, DNA variations that cause IBD in the population. So now we've, from the universe of genes, we've now localized what's the subnetwork uh, the subset of genes and how they're connected, that's actually driving the disease in the population. When I zoom into that particular network, we can start seeing all the individual players that are involved in the disease and how they fit together in different pathways. So the different co color codings represent different types of processes that are being disrupted by these DNA variations or the environment that go on to cause disease. And once we have that information, what can we do with it? Well, now we can query that system and understand what are the key drivers, what are the genes that if we twist them a little bit, they're going to alter the state of that network and tell us that that's a good therapeutic. That's a good therapeutic point of intervention or a good biomarker to assess disease risk. So to show you that in an animation, here we have that network. And now we're querying on a supercomputer all the genes were in silico through simulation, knocking them down, overexpressing them, and then seeing how does the network respond to those perturbations. And every now and then, we find a gene that affects the entire state of the network, like this gene. It goes on. Perturbations in that gene go on to affect the entire state of the network. That's what we call a key driver. And those become the genes that we want to pursue for therapeutic intervention, right? So it's this in silico data-driven modeling that takes us from the linear domain of the DNA to the highly nonlinear complex, complexity of the living system but allows us to query it in ways that we can actually achieve understanding. So that's the kind of the goal uh, that we want to get out of uh, how, we, how we model life, given all of this big data. Once we have that sort of a model, now we can hook up the networks of disease, these systems that are, that are either dysregulated by the environment or dysregulated by your genetics, and we can start mapping them to the, to the drugs, the natural products, or the environmental changes that uh, can have positive benefits. So what you're looking at here, the blue nodes, represent that network that I was just showing you for IBD that, that's very dysregulated through the genetic loci that are associated with IBD in the human population. The green nodes represent all marketed drugs, all natural products that are known or predicted to interact with the coding products of that network. Right? So we're making this map to say, what are all the available things that exist in foods or things that exist uh, that in FDA-approved compounds? And how do those hook up to that network? And then the pink nodes are the disease, the physiological, pathophysiological traits that are changing as a result of perturbations to that network. So by constructing this map right, of, of natural products, drugs, and the natural products, they could also be environmental behavior modifications, uh, how those all fit together to affect uh, the network. And ultimately, what we get is this sort of model where now all of the individuals, we're looking at the perturbations in the individuals and actually seeing which parts of the network are being affected in each individual, something we call precision medicine, where we can now link each individual to the specific sub-network that's affecting whatever condition they have. So we can map the particular networks to the individuals, and then based on that mapping, we can, we can understand what's the kind of treatment that this individual needs to uh, overcome their condition. So it could be a drug, it could be drug and uh, behavior modification, or it may be just a behavior modification that would uh, do the trick. 
And we had done something like this uh, with, uh, uh, just to show you how general this type of modeling is and how generally it can, form, it can inform the human condition. We applied this to a study uh, that Deepak uh, Chopra had run, a meditation study, where uh, we looked at uh, people pre and post uh, meditation. So this was with a pretty broad group, many of which you'll meet at the panel discussion on this study. Uh, but what you're looking at here is the network uh, from that study where we analyzed blood from the individuals who, who participated in this study, both pre and post meditation. We construct from all the molecular data we generated on them this particular network. And the highlights you're looking at now are the parts of the network that were changed, that were altered as a result of the meditation exercise. And what we saw changing, it was pretty dramatic, and I'm not a person who meditates here who is uh, necessarily uh, into that kind of thing, but I was stunned to see, first of all, the sheer number of genes that were changed between the pre-meditation state and the post-meditation state. And when we project them onto the network, they weren't randomly changing. They were very coherent and affecting very specific processes. For example, suppressing networks that are asso associated with defense response and inflammation and immune response. That was all being suppressed while activating or enhancing networks that were involved in what we call biological quality, so overall enhancing your overall state of uh, well-being. So pretty amazing. Uh, uh, you know, this study is going to go even deeper. Uh, there's going to be bigger studies integrating more information, uh, but we're very excited. What's that? After this, are you meditating now? I'm, uh, I'm, you know what I'm doing? Has, has this changed What you? I'm doing is I'm saying, what are the drugs that will mimic the <laughs> meditation? <laughs> so, I, I just have to say, I'm uh, like an ADD type guy. So when I think about like sitting for the path four days. Less taken. <laughs> well, Eric, I think there's a lot of people that in the room are listening, going, okay, molecular networks, right? And they what define. What I'm hearing is Legos didn't work for him as a child. <laughs> no, no, he was much. But say, talking about how they define these disease states. So let's say a lot of people in this room, right, have a relative with Alzheimer's. Um, they, they know it's in their, in their family, uh, you know. It's happened a number, it's in the generation. By studying this, and what can you tell us about the future? I don't know, is it well, you five start, years, I mean, You 10? started out in a very depressing way. You said 30 years ago, we identified a gene and we didn't make progress. Are you more optimistic now, or is this just a long way to say that, that we've got a lot of stuff, but we're still not using it Yeah, like it right. how much yeah, closer I'm, are we? I would say I'm very optimistic. I think the, the you know, point I was trying to drive home in the depressing part was that we can't understand the complexity of life by looking in a single dimension at a time, by looking at a single gene, at a single mutation, because it's just much more complicated than that. But if we can generate the right scales of data, integrate it, and build these kinds of models where we can actually achieve understanding, then we can actually go and, and understand how does Alzheimer's evolve over the, long, over the long haul, and how can we prevent it? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard this from Rudy, that only 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant. The rest are subject to all these factors, including stress and relaxation and even, even emotions. Absolutely. So that's a, it's a great point, that these mutations that occur, they don't guarantee that you're going to get the disease. They simply predispose you to getting that disease. So the question is, what can you do to compensate for these negative hits? You're going to have negative hits. You're going to have positive hits. Sometimes your genetics will be good enough to overcome that, sometimes not. So what kind of behavior modi modifications can you make, whether it's meditation or exercising or changing your diet? Those are the, th the sorts of things that we can map uh, to this sort of network. And in the future, this is my final slide. I view you know, this sort of application on your smartphone, you know, sort of a GPS for your health, where what you're looking at here is a pretty sophisticated amount of information. It's a 3D phase plane plot where the XY coordinates represent the, all the possible states that you can be in based on all this molecular information. The Z coordinate, the Z axis represents the probability given your current state, you know, that, or given your current makeup that you're in a given state. So you can see if you're up in the big mountain, uh, if, you're, if you're over in those states, you're likely to be in a well or a normal state, whereas if you're at the Little Mountain, this was a diabetes uh, sort of plot, you're going uh, to have a higher probability of being in a disease state. But what we can do through this modeling is we can define the trajectories that take you from one state to the next state and define the genes, how you would have to perturb them to move you from one state, from a disease state to a well state, 
And once we know that, we can start understanding what are the genes that meditation affects? How does it drive those genes? So is that, a, is that a path that can take you on one of those trajectories to lead you from disease to wellness? Or what are the changes in your diet? Or what are the small molecule compounds that can also drive you on a trajectory and, and take you from a disease state to well state? So these are the types of, as we can monitor more information on ourselves, this is the type of navigation equipment that I think we'll be able to you know, access every day on our smartphone to tell us where we're at, what, what's the trajectory we're on, and if it's a bad trajectory, how do we bounce off that trajectory to get onto another one that's going to drive us into a well state?